and masters study the Southern group in Rio de Janeiro, so masters in the Zouave uh, saga, a friend of ours. And then uh, she went to the University of Chicago, where uh, she did her PhD under uh, Wayne Wu. After that, a postdoc uh, at uh, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, with Wu, I think, Wu Zheng. And now she's a postdoc at, uh, at the University of Arizona. So she's been participating in several June and July. So she just arrived uh, last week and she'll be around. So when you guys want to talk, uh, please, uh, please uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, Rogério and um, his collaborators know my admiration from ICTPU is, is a center that makes me proud of being Brazilian and inspired me to come back to my own country to do science. So. Uh, Today I'm gonna to talk about research that I have been doing the next few years um, in the cosmology. And I hope that by the end of this talk, I will be able to introduce you three main ideas about our universe. First, I would like to convince you that there are, broadly speaking, uh, three main epochs that I call early, intermediate, and late, and I will define what those epochs are and what they mean. That second, that there is uncertainties in the physical process that dictates the dynamics of each of these epochs. And finally, that these uncertainties can all impact the observed background expansion and the observed structure formation that we observe today in the late universe. And that's important because ICTPU, as, as well as many universities in the United States, are making a huge effort to observe the universe today and to use those measurements to try to understand the nature of dark energy. Therefore, this talk will be a, like a warning that maybe in order to understand dark energy, we will have to understand better the entire history of the universe. But before that, and I know ICTPU has many areas of research that does not include cosmology, I would like to make a, 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 a review of the standard history of the universe. So we, we, we assume the hot Big Bang scenario, the universe started hot and dense, uh, and right after the universe started its first phase of accelerated expansion, that is called inflation. It's a, it's a phase that really resembles the space-time that's created by the cosmological constant, but we know that inflation were not dictated by a cosmological constant because this first phase of accelerated expansion ended and the universe decelerated afterwards. Uh, this is around uh, 10 to the minus 33 seconds. After that, the universe became dominated, its energy budget became dominated by relativistic species, and that's the radiation era. And the important aspect of the radiation era is that the universe was expanding so fast that uh, structures could not form and could not grow in time. Around 300,000 years, the universe cooled down to around 0.2 electron volts, uh, cold enough that atoms of hydrogen could, could um, recombine. That's the called the recombination. Notice that the temperature is not 13.6 electron volts, it's 0.2, and there is um, a reason for that. Uh, and this is when the universe became transparent and becomes neutral, and uh, is where the photons of the so-called cosmic microwave background were emitted. And that's the topic of my PhD uh, thesis. So this universe from Big Bang to recombination is what, what I define as early universe, and it's the golden era to be probed by the cosmic microwave background. So after recombination, the universe became now dominated by non-relativistic species, such as cold dark matter. Uh, and, um, and finally, for the first time in its history, the expansion were gentle enough 
that structures could grow in time. Another interesting aspect of these dark ages is that there were some relativistic species that actually have mass, such as neutrinos. Uh, and this is the epoch where they made a transition from relativistic to non-relativistic behavior. And that transition does impact the observed um, background expansion and structure formation of the current universe. This kind of ended around half a billion years where uh, the first stars were born. And because there were no metals in the intergalactic mediums, and metals for astronomy has a very different meaning, is everything above lithium. Uh, these, these stars were very massive, and, and they emitted so much ionized radiation that the universe ionized by, for the second time. The universe currently is ionized, and that's the so-called reionization. And the universe between recombination and reionization is what I define as the intermediate universe, and is the golden era to be probed by futuristic 21 centimeters. Yes, uh, a lower bound is 0.06 that comes from the experiments. Uh, um, a higher bound uh, that depends on what you assume for dark energy, for example, but for the. The lower. Yes, we can get and, and because that does impact uh, the structure formation in a way that we can probe. Um, um, we actually only have an upper bound, but. I, I, yes, um, we currently only have our upper bound, uh, and what I claim is that if this, what I claim is if this mass is high enough, it's a slightly higher than one, then we will able to see, and we actually can get an upper limit of the mass, um, and it's, we know that it's it's massive because there is a lower limit from experiments. And because it's massive, we know that it transitions somewhere in the intermediate universe. And we know that this transition does have effects that we can probe and we'll be able to probe in the LSST and get up both an upper bound and a lower bound. Not yet. We don't have yet. Yeah. But we still have an interesting aspect that we can probe very, like the upper bound, which is actually another five times better than we can get from accelerators. So finally, the second phase started around half a billion years up to today. Uh, that's what we call late universe. And there's some interesting aspects about the late universe. First, during its first half, approximately half, the universe was still dominated by non-relativistic species such as cold dark matter. But in the second half, the universe started to accelerate again for the second time in its life. And now we think that maybe, maybe, it's due to a cosmological constant, but we still don't know. Another interesting aspect of the late universe is that now for many relevant scales, the gravitational collapse became nonlinear both in over-dense and under-dense regions, and therefore now we need antibody simulations and other techniques to, ex to extract uh, information from such structures. That's also when the peaks of star formation and other baryonic effects happen in the universe, and that does make our life harder to extract information about dark matter and dark energy from, um, from such structures. But this is the golden era of optical astronomy. That's why we have the Dark Energy Survey, we have the, large, the LSST, we have the W4 satellite that I work on. You know, this is the epoch to be probed by optical data. So we have all these different, type, different aspects of the universe with different characteristics. And so how can we probe this? Because you know, cosmology is not an experimental science. We cannot build parts of the universe in a laboratory and you know, ignore or, and, and, and isolate the variables we want. We just receive a, a unique universe, and we need to extract information from different epochs. And to do that, we have these schools of observers. And currently, observational cosmology has four main schools of observers that measure different aspects and different phases of the universe. 
such, such, uh, here I'm just doing a cartoonish, you know, of like uh, kind of arbitrary division of our community. But these, these schools are mainly the observation of the Hubble constant and type 1a supernova, the observation of the cosmic microwave background, where I, 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 I think I belong, uh, observation of, of gravitational uh, lensing of optical galaxy and counting of nonlinear clusters, where Rogério Rosenfeld lies, I believe, you might disagree, so so. Uh, I also have research in here. And, also, and finally, um, the observation of some called baryonic acoustic oscillation. And I will define better what they mean, but for here, I would like to do the following exercise with you. I would like to take a subset of this data, for example, the cosmic microwave background and baryonic acoustic oscillation. I would like to see what universe that, uh, that subset of data implies or favors. And then I would like to compare that universe with the universe that is favored by the other subset of data, for example, type 1a supernova and gravitational lensing of optical galaxies. And I would like to see if these universes are compatible with each other. That's a great way to, under, to, to check the consistency of the standard model as well as the consistency of our data sets because there are a lot of systematic effects that can come around. And when you do this exercise, you actually find interesting behavior and unexpected behavior. So here, for example, I'm showing the predicted value for the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background, as well as baryonic oscillation, and how this evolves in time against the direct measurement of the Hubble constant uh, using um, local type 1a supernova. This is prediction, this is, this is measurement. And you can see that they are not agreeing with each other, and this agreement is growing in time. And right now, it's at 4.4 sigma, getting close to the five sigma behavior that particle physicists means that is acceptable. Cosmology, everything above two sigma is acceptable, but we are reaching you now the new standard of five sigma. Things like gravitational waves can be the future tiebreakers, but the error bar is still too large. Um, so, no, if you, be, if you believe, as I do, that the, 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 the cosmic microwave background is correct, uh, then uh, the disagreement is that the local universe seems to be expanding way too fast. There's another disagreement between the predictions of the cosmic microwave background versus the measurements from the gravitational lensing of an interesting parameter that we call S8. S8 is a parameter that mixes information both from the background expansion as well as from the, from the uh, structure formation. And a way to understand this parameter is the following. If you have two universes, A and B, and we impose that they have the same amount of cold dark matter, then the universe that has higher S8 is more inhomogeneous. In that sense, S8 measures the amount of inhomogeneity in our local universe. But there's an alternative interpretation that if you have two universes and you impose the same amount of homogeneity in this universe at certain scale, which is 8 megaparsec, 18 verse, that's why it's S8, then, the, then the, 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 um, the universe that has higher S8 is the universe that has more cold dark matter. Therefore, S8 has this you know, double interpretation. This zero bar seems large, but we can, you know, we were trying to combine all these experiments in which we will make uh, this disagreement to reach an interesting level. But you can see that the universe from the cosmic microwave background always predicts a higher S8. So the exercise that we have just done, which is the core of the research in cosmology today, is that if we believe that the universe probed by these two experiments is the standard model of a cosmology, then the universe that we actually see expands way too fast, and it's either too homogeneous or has or is too empty of cold dark matter. Such result may imply that dark energy is not a cosmological constant, and there are people that uh, believe that. But this talk is a cautionary tale that in order to reach this conclusion from these uh, uh, disagreements between different data sets, we have to make sure of what happens before dark energy takes in place because there are physics in all these epochs that can change the observed background and observed structure formation. Um, a technical uh, aspect that I will need for this talk and I will introduce 
is the concept of two-point correlation function. So this is the map of the cosmic microwave background and the map of the anisotropies in the intensity of the photons that we observe from, from, from this radio sigma, uh, cold and hot. And the, way it, the, the cosmic microwave background is a near black body, of, a near isotropic with a monopole of three Kelvin and temperature anisotropies of 10 to the minus five Kelvin. So it's really nearly, but not quite an isotropic radiation. And the way we observe and we extract information from the cosmic microwave background is that we, we, we take our telescope, such as the South Pole telescope, we, we point to one direction, we measure the temperature and the two polarization states of these photons, we do the same in another direction, and as a, as a fixed angle, we make averages of the whole sky. With that, we can compute temperature, temperature, polarization, polarization, temperature, polarization, correlation functions. For simplicity, I didn't expand the polarization in its two states. But we are physicists, and, and as in many uh, uh, exercises that we, we do in ENM, it's actually simpler to understand the same problem in Fourier space. So when you take the Fourier space of the temperature correlation function, for example, you, you, you notice that there, there's two aspects. There is a, a, diff, a, a, a plateau and a series of uh, oscillations. And what I would like you to know for this talk is that we can use the position and the relative amplitude of these oscillations to understand the context of the universe, as well as aspect of this plateau. That's how we extract information using the cosmic microwave background. We can do the similar trick with, uh, uh, with the structure formation, and uh, we actually use traces, but we can pretend that we, we have a fictitious dark matter telescope, and we do the same exercise. We measure over densities or under densities of cold dark matter in one direction, correlate with the one, another one as a function of angle, make average over the sky. This is the matter, matter correlation function. Again, we take the Fourier transform because uh, it's, it's easier to think that way. And here is the famous matter power spectrum that you see in, in, the, in the cosmology course. And for, and for simplicity, I'm very here one of the parameters that dictates the dynamics of inflation. And I'm show you two things. First, that physics that happen within the first second of the universe can still affect measurements that we make today. And second, and most important, that these changes are consistent between the CMB and the late universe. There's a consistency between the early and late universe that cannot be broken in the standard model of cosmology. And that's exactly that consistency that is failing today. Why? With that, I, I finish the introduction. It's a good time for questions. Okay. So now, I'm talking about the first part of my research, uh, uh, um, thoughts that I had about the early universe. Again, uh, this is the golden era to be probed by the cosmic microwave background, that signal that's uh, nearly isotropic. Uh, you know, and there's like these, these anisotropies that we see can be created in two ways in the, the cosmic microwave background. It can be a primary anisotropies that is created in the early universe, but then that's the key aspect and that, that differs cosmology from everything else that is done in this, in this center, that we are not an experimental science, we are an observational science, and therefore the photons of this, that was created in the early universe has to travel the entire universe to reach us, and a lot of things can, can happen that universe that will change the temperature and the polarization correlations of these photons, creating what we call a secondary anisotropies, and therefore the CMB can probe both the late and the early universe. As I show you now, if you take the Fourier transform of the temperature correlation function, we get the temperature pulse spectrum, which has this plateau at large scales and this series of oscillations that we call the acoustic peaks. And this is the, our, like, uh, one of our latest observations. So the first thing you can notice that, you know, we understand quite well what happens in the CMB. The, the, the agreement between theory and data is actually remarkable. And, and when you take this, we, we, we think we can compute uh, this correlation function by introducing two physics. First, the physics of inflation that produce the seeds that with gravitational collapse becomes over-dense and under-dense regions. 
And after, we can also think we can, using Boltzmann equations and perturbation theory, know what is the transfer function, how, what, how, what the universe behaves after inflations up to today. So uh, I will focus now on the part from inflation, and we think that in the standard model of inflation, when the universe behaves very close, but not precisely like an universe that's dominated by a cosmological constant, the, 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 the Fourier transform of these seeds, which is the primordial power spectrum, has a power law structure that has an amplitude and a, and a tilt, and those are two of the six free parameters of the standard model of cosmology. It's a great fit. It does well, but can inflation be richer? You know, uh, can, uh, particle physicists can be very creative, and so can they create models that actually work and predict a more interesting behavior? That's a question that I work during my PhD. Uh, here is a reference. Part of the name is um, blocked because unfortunately names cannot be changed afterwards. Uh, and here we show that, yeah, it's actually possible. So just a proof of principle, uh, we create models and propose models that on top of that power law produces a series of oscillations uh, that you can, can see here that could be probed by the data is the order of the error bars of the data. And I could give a whole talk about this type of models, but here I just want to see, to give you as a proof of principle, yes, inflation can be richer and more complicated. Because of that, we actually we can also do the all, uh, an interesting alternative exercise. We actually think that the physics of the transfer function is more solid than the physics of inflation, uh, and therefore we can ask the data. Like, can, given the data, can we test these uh, uh, standard models of inflation? And we did this exercise, so this is the basic predictions of a power law, and we actually found that the current data pr uh, prefers models that have deficit of power in large scales. This is a Fourier transform, therefore low K modes is large scales. Again, this has many interesting aspects for inflation itself, and I can give a whole talk about that. But here, I want to ask a different question. I want to ask what is the relation between uncertainties in the physics of inflation versus our ability to predict the universe afterwards. For example, you know, how uncertainty in inflation is connected to our ability to, to probe the late universe. That's why blue is actually mixed with green here. Because in my color code, blue is early, green is late, red is intermediate, and I try to be consistent. So to understand that, you have to understand how the CMB predicts the, the, the value of the Hubble constant. You know, people say that the CMB actually measures the Hubble constant. This is false. It's a prediction. And it comes a prediction that needs two types of information. It needs the positions of these peaks, as I showed you before. But it also needs the relative amplitude of this oscillation with respect to the plateau. And, the, the, and, the, and, and half of the power that, that, that of this plateau comes from inflation. And therefore, if you change inflation, you might change the predictions from the Hubble constant. We did this exercise, and for two, two, two different types of cuts, uh, and what we found is that you know, with the standard model of inflation, you predict the solid lines, why, you know, with a model of inflation that actually fits better the data, we predict the, the shaded lines. And an interesting aspect of this plot is that whenever inflation, if you get a better model of inflation, with respect to the data, the Hubble constant shifts down. That means that it increases the, the, the discrepancy between the predictions and data. And this uh, is what I have to talk about inflation. What are other ways that um, the early universe can, can in Yeah, um, if you go to multi multiple fields and I really allow things, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, but for single field inflation, 
it, it's fine. Even if, even if it's low rho, it's violated. Even if you allow this more interesting behavior, there is still enough predictions to rule out single field. For example, there is a very well uh, a relation between the, 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 the tilt of tensor spectra and the amplitude of scalars that there's no preparameters there. So you're predicting something with two supermodules. Yeah, it's single field. And in single field, I can avoid that kind of um, questions that are super valid for uh, multi-field multi inflation. So different ways, the early universe. So one way is that we actually not sure about the amount of radiation that there is in the early universe. For example, there are, there are, you could have interesting uh, actual species of neutrinos that we call sterile neutrinos, as well as different kind of, of dark radiation. You know, cold dark matter could, could have been a relativistic species in the past that made that transition to non-relativistic behavior. And the uncertainties in, 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 for neutrinos, the uncertainties in the number of neutrino species is, is summarized by this parameter N effective. And you can see that these uncertainties correlate perfectly with the predictions from the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. Again, uh, if you put more relativistic, uh, relativistic behavior, that means that the relativistic error will last longer. This is an error, as I told you before, the universe expanded so fast that its structure could not evolve in time, and therefore this does impact the, the structure formation that we observe today. And use that, we in the dark energy survey, the Y1 dark energy survey, we tried to probe this parameter, and we were able, uh, with the year one, to get slightly better prediction uh, constraints from the current data. It seems you know, that it is small, but remember, this is just the Y1 data. There will be six years of data, and these constraints will get better. Again, another, another relation between you know, uh, early and late. And actually, we, there's many people, that, lots of people in the United States that do believe that in order to solve the standard model of cosmology, we will have to introduce new degrees of freedom in the early universe, such as self-interacting neutrinos or early dark energy, because this seems to be the kind of explanation that, that can that fits better um, uh, and resolves better um, the, the problems we face so far. With that, I ended the discussions about the early universe and go to the intermediate one, and it's a good time for questions. Okay, survive with me. Uh, good, so now the intermediate universe. Uh, so I will focus on the epoch of reionization. As I told you before, when the universe started to be half a billion years, uh, there was a lot of gas, uh, but no metals that could cool down this gas. So it formed enormous stars with masses around 100 solar masses. And those, those stars emitted so much ionized radiation that the universe became ionized by the second time. And it continued to be ionized up to today. So this is a very difficult problem in cosmology because these photons travel. So it's a, tra it's a radiation transfer uh, problem, which tends to be the hardest problem you can face in astrophysics. And, 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 and that one that involves multiple scales, because these stars are local. They're in the intergalactic median. So uh, the gravity is nonlinear there, so you need computers. And these photons travel uh, the entire volume of the universe, so you need an uh, uh, anybody simulation that has lots of resolution and a huge box, and that's the exact type of problem that's almost impossible to solve with current generation of computers and even futuristic ones. Uh, but we can use the cosmic microwave background to help us solve this problem. So I ask you to you know, take the dust out of the Jackson books that you use in your e &M courses and try to think about the same problems we had before. You know, we have this radiation, and we're trying to me measure the angular correlation function of this radiation. But now, we are, we are introducing a sheet of free electrons between the, the, the telescope and the, and, and the CMB. And we would like to ask what the sheet of free electrons can do to the initial uh, imprint of anisotropism in this radiation bath. 
So when you do this, you, you find that there's two ways. These photons, we scatter some of these photons. The, these electrons, we scatter some of these photons, and therefore reduces the amount of anisotropies we see in the sky. The more free electrons, the more anisotropy is damped in the temperature, and you can see this here. So there is this, this I came from the PhD thesis of my advisor, and you can see that if there were enough electrons in the universe, you can actually erase, totally erase, uh, the uh, oscillations we see today. We don't erase it here, and that's an interesting question, and that's related to the horizon size of the universe at the time of reionization. So, so this is, in the temperature, this is one of the predictions. You know, it changes this amplitude, uh, and we think, we, and you can see, remember the arrow bars here, it seems very small, so it seems that we can uh, constrain the physics of reionization very precisely, but things are not that easily because this amplitude also comes from inflation. So here is another interesting mix between uh, different epochs of the universe where a single prediction comes from a mix of the early universe and the intermediate one, the optical depth that comes from reionization. It seems impossible to solve such kind of degeneracies. That's not quite true because there's an effect of gravitational lensing. You know, if you have more inflation, you have more structures, the, the light bends a lot more. And this produces, uh, so at fixed product, you can produce effects if you have more lensing and less lensing. It can produce a difference, in, a fractional difference to the standard model that are in sync with the, the, the photos itself. And that's a very interesting problem to do in, in an ENM course. But here, for the focus of this talk, I will, I will try to... Just a quick question. Why did the first groups for us, the air bars for the low angle, the same for us compared to the... That's a great question. It's because um, this is near... So this comes from a random field, so you need modes uh, to extract, you know, reduce your air bar of the estimator. Uh, and our universe is finite. It's a finite box. No. So when you do uh, your um, ferric harmonic decomposition, because we are doing a Fourier transform in the sky, there's two numbers, there's L and M. And because we have an isotropic universe, and this is a Gaussian random field, I'm only plot in terms of L because we, we, we don't think the, the prediction depends on M. But for each L, you only have two L plus one modes, and therefore your error bars, you have more modes to reconstruct that random field at larger L. That's a fundamental limitation in our ability uh, to extract information from the universe, and that's what's so called cosmic variance. Okay. But for the purpose of this talk, I would like to focus on the, on, the, on the Fourier transform of the polarization spectra, not the temperature. So this is one of the two polarization modes, the E mode, that's the polarization power spectrum. And I like to do the following exercise. I, I, I take the redshift, which is basically time. The higher the redshift, the more early the university you are. Uh, and I would like to make delta functions perturbations in the ionization fraction as a function of redshift, you know, to check. You know, is CMB sensitive, sensitive on when reionization started, how it ended, how it evolved? You know, so you do this kind of like, uh, it's it really similar, it's similar to a green function analysis where you, you make a, a delta function, you know, external force, and then you kind of sum up it up, you know, using um, the superposition principle. It's kind of similar. Uh, so, uh, so you do this, and you find that this, the, the polarization power spectrum is sensitive to, uh, to the evolution of the, the, the reionization itself. A reionization that started very early on, redshift to 49, produces a signal that's very different from a, re, uh, a reionization that happens you know, around half a billion years. This is like 50 million years. So there's almost a factor of 10 in time here. So based on that, based that the CMB is sensitive, and this is something that people didn't realize, it was not, it's, not, it's not a widespread uh, um, um, knowledge. So we, we try to test the standard model of reionization, which assumes that second generation of stars, pop two stars, generated all the photons uh, that ionize the universe. And there are other alternatives. For example, cold dark matter could could decay and produce extra amount of photons. And indeed, we do see those photons in the galactic center. So when we do this, when we use the data, we actually found an, another interesting thing, that the prediction for the standard model is in the dashed black line. 
and what are reconstructions the blue one and again you know there's like a two sigma ish in the Planck 2015 data that did make the disagreement between them again I could give I, I already have give, given whole talks about reionization uh, and how that means it could mean extra dark matter decay it could mean pop three stars and actually when you try I have a paper about pop three generations with this and, and, and with interesting bound. But here I want to ask a different question, you know. Given that reionization can be more complicated, how does this affect our ability to test the early universe? Because remember, this is not an experimental physics, it's an observational one. And we observe the whole universe together. So because of this, we, we did our exercise of inflation, and we found that you know the the the, 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 the difference between the standard model of inflation and what the data actually wants depends on our assumption of reionization. And that thing on the other side changes the way you predict the Hubble constant. You see the whole cycle going in here, and that's why cosmology is hard. And that comes because reionization affects the balances between large scales and small scales, as well as inflation. This is what I have to talk about reionization. And let's talk about different ways the intermediate and late type universe can be connected to each other. So here, I'm showing, so I'm showing the, 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 the predictive value of this S8 and the predictive value of the Hubble constant. Remember, the two parameters that are, are taking my dreams and making me having nightmares, and as well as Rogério, having nightmares about these two parameters because they don't agree. But in this model, I did some, I don't know, these people have done something different, and, and I actually was, I was scooped by them because I was having similar thoughts, uh, but there, there are other ways we can work and something that I'm talking to Rogero right now. But here, I did, here they did something different. They assume dark energy is actually given by the cosmological constant, but they allow 5%, 5 or 6% of dark matter to decay into radiation. Dark matter decaying into radiation means a non-relativistic species decaying to relativistic one, and this actually makes predictions that you know, uh, we, with different levels, starting to be sensitive to. And what we see that the prediction of the, the cosmic microwave background, if you allow cold dark matter to decay, actually changes exactly to the direction we need to make to compatible with the data. So is this a dark energy or dark matter problem? Maybe neither. Another thing that I have done similar, I've collaboration, collaborated at Harvard, is to do a similar type of analysis but with massive neutrinos. We think we can get an upper bound of the massive neutrinos that is related to it's around 0.3 EV, which is like five times better than, than uh, what we can get from an accelerator. But this depends on our assumption of inflation. <coughs> so on purpose, we make very wild uh, assumptions about, sorry, uh, inflation, uh, assumptions about dark energy. So on purpose, we made very wild assumptions on dark energy here, and we show that, um, uh, the, the, the constraints, the upper limits of constraints of mass neutrinos can actually change by a factor three depending on how crazy dark energy is. It doesn't mean that we believe dark energy uh, is actually that crazy, but if you're a particle physicist, dark energy is a systematic and you have to take into account. And that, and just, and that comes, this is for example, uh, the fractional difference in the distances because changes, uh, changes in neutrinos from relativistic to non-relativistic behavior does change the background in a way that BO actually does not like. And here is the fractional difference. So you can see that in comparison to the standard model, there's a, there's an, a, a, neutrinos like to have a positive fractional difference. But if dark energy is wild, dark energy can actually undo this behavior and make it very compatible with the data. So if you're a particle physicist and you want to do cosmology to probe particle behavior, you have to be aware of what happened in the dark energy sector. You know, and this is something, uh, but, but we know dark energy only, only stays in the universe up to redshift one. So if you ask 10 years ago, and actually a few years ago, actually last year, uh, you, you talk to physicists and they say, why do we need to go to high redshift universe? People say, we don't. 
So a lot, a lot of cosmologists believe that everything that we can be done by observing baryonic acoustic oscillation or type NA supernova of the redshift one. I'm one of the only voices in the United States that is pushing hard for go to redshift between one and six because there's no dark energy there. And I think that interesting stuff in the intermediate universe that can be pro better if you go to high redshift tracers. And I think my voice is actually you know, spreading around and it's influenced um, um, some of the choices in the that first supernova um, team, for example. With that, um, I finished what I have to talk about the early universe, and I'm open to questions. No, the sum of the inner masses. So we know. So you assume you have three species of all the. This. So in the standard model of cosmology. We have this result. This is in lambda CDM, standard model. And you can even push to 0.2. So it's around 0.3, but people believe you can actually do better. Could be a stereo neutrino also. Yes. Although stereo neutrinos also introduce a, a different degree, which is ineffective. So um, this is assuming 3.046 for the number of relativistic species. So it can change a little bit, but it's that order of magnitude. While, while you know, in, in, in accelerators or in, in direct measurements, this is all around 2 EV. Okay. So late universe. So we know that the universe is accelerating again for the first, for the second time in its life. And we know that now maybe, maybe, it can, it is due to a cosmological constant. I'm still not convinced it is. Uh, and here is the latest uh, compilation of type 1 supernova, and an exercise that I always ask my students to do is to, and this is magnitudes, because astronomers like to have this interesting uh, um, 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 scale, which is the logarithm of the flux, and the higher the magnitude, the fainter you are. I know this is a physics department, so I always make this introduction on astronomy notation. Uh, and, uh, and so I always ask my students to compute what is the distance modulus predicted by a universe that only has cold dark matter. And if you do this, more or less, I did this by hand, but it's approximately true. Uh, the prediction of a cold dark matter only universe is half of magnitude brighter than we actually observe at redshift one. So our supernovas are too faint. And if you ask Adam Rees, and you imply that Adam Rees is making a mistake of half a magnitude, you, get, you lose a friend. Because uh, you know, the community believes that we can make observations up to 0.1 magnitude or 0.01 magnitude, not 0.5. So, uh, and, and this is the standard model, and, and it's true. Uh, the background expansion, the background expansion of the, the late universe is very similar to um, what predicted by the standard model. So I work on the W first, this NASA satellite uh, um, um, that it was one of the two success of Hubble. So NASA made a call in 2006 for 200 scientists uh, to, to to try to see what we can do with with this uh, satellite. And we published what I believe is the state-of-the-art simulated uh, likelihood analysis. Uh, and here I'm just showing two models of dark energy models that are completely indistinguishable by data. And, uh, and they will be distinguished by uh, this new satellite. We can also see there's two proposed strategies, one that goes up to redshift 1.5, one to try to reach is a redshift 0.3. And the choice of analysis depends on what your theoretical beliefs. If you believe the universe is lambda CDM, then this seems to be the safer choice. And, but if you believe the interesting thing can happen in the intermediate universe, you, you want to go that far. So, you know, uh, the way you build your experiment depends on theoretical beliefs, and I think that um, is why I try to ask uh, these questions uh, going to different redshifts. So one of the questions that w first can actually uh, um, answer alone is, is the background expansion in this redshift range compatible with the cosmological constant? This is a question that w first can answer alone. doesn't depend on anything. doesn't depend on what the intermediate or late universe does. It's very difficult to change that. But let's assume the universe is not a lambda CDM. Let's assume that we do find 
a discrepancy, then what? What is the particle nature of dark energy? What are the physical assumptions? I'm not just the one to change parameters like the dark energy equation state. I want to understand the physics of dark energy, what it is. Uh, so for this, I believe that um, dark energy, uh, the supernova cannot answer alone. Let me give you an example. So this was started in the last decade and uh, it's part of um, a work that I have done so far that if you, if you ask a particle physicist, like, please construct me the simplest model of dark energy that is not a cosmological constant. What is the physical assumption a particle physicist would, would make in order to build that model? I truly believe that the simplest assumptions are the following four. You believe that GR is correct because changing gravity is hard. I have one paper with EOR Vaga on modified gravity where I could find early in my career how hard it is. So we would like to keep that in place. You would like to assume that besides the universal coupling of gravity, there is no directly coupling between dark energy, dark matter, or dark energy of the standard model. You don't have like dark energy versus, I don't know, neutrinos doing something and creating another thing. And you also will believe that inside the horizon, way inside the horizon where relativistic effects is negligible, you don't, you don't have dark energy collapsing. It would be very nice to have halos of dark energy or, or you know, even planets of dark energy. You can go wild. But I think for the simplistic assumption, you assume that dark energy is smooth. So these are four physical assumptions, not just a parameter. And we, we will learn a lot if those, one of those four assumptions are falsified. We will learn physics. Um, which is much more profound than, than, than learning the, the value of some particular parameter. So with these four physical assumptions, you can ask yourself, what are all models I can create that are compatible with those physical assumptions? And, and this diagram here of complexity, you start with the standard model, and the way you can make the standard model more complex is you either introduce curvature or flat slicings, this is one of the first things you, you learn in a, in a cosmological course. Now, are triangles, do triangles have 180 degrees or more or less in, on flat slices of the space time? But you can also go to canonical single field, scalar fields, or uh, which is called quintessence. You can make quintessence uh, more general by, uh, it can even be multiple fields, but then CS is not one. Let's start with single field. And you can make either curvature and flat slicing, but also you, you, you add a, a different degree of freedom, which is you can have early dark energy. And it can be very early in the intermediate or in the early. You can have tracking, towing, or, or tracking models that makes dark energy pop up in different places. So, because we know the curvature of the whole space time is, is different from zero, because you know, it's not an Euclidean one. But then flat slicing, you, you, you know, there are preferred observers in our universe, which is the, universe, the one that, goes, that expands with the Hubble flow. So that, that makes a preferential um, time error, arrow and a preferential uh, observers. And in this one, you can ask what, you know, make slicings, 3D slicings that has constant time, constant proper time. And in those slicings, you can have different coverture. You know, if you make triangles on those slicings, flat, then you make a triangle from here to Mars and you know, to the moon, then you can make the measurement. Are, is this triangle has 180 degrees in the sum of the angles or have more or less? Is it, is, it sphere, is, it, is it a sphere or a, one of those saddles or is it Euclidean? It's different, uh, it's, it's still a freedom of Hubble and so metric, but it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's more, the standard model of cosmology assumes that the flat slicing is Euclidean. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, when you add curvature, you add in complexity, you add in extra, you know. This is not a dynamical parameter. You can, you can only choose, you, know, you cannot go from Euclidean to, to, to curve, but it's a more complex model. Yeah, we also assume like flat lambda scale, like the standard model where, where, where we work most of. Don't measure that. Is it assumption or We do. Uh, the cosmic microwave background has power to 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 infer the, the curvature. That power actually depends a little bit on dark energy. We know it's very close. It's very close to zero, 
Uh, yeah, that's also a prediction from inflation, but an experiment can never, ever tell us exactly zero. So, you know, a, a curvature of 10 to the minus four, it, it's still a curve along the DM, which is very close to the flat one. There's a continuous limit that makes things hard. But in principle, you know, you can buy D4, say, I believe in inflation, and if you believe in inflation, the curvature is zero. Because there's many more E folds, you know, is diluted by the number of E folds of inflation, which can be infinite. Um, uh, so, so here's canonical scalar field. The basic canonical scalar field cannot have cannot uh, have an equation of state that is less than minus one. So, yeah, it's greater than minus one. So you can go to smooth dark energy models that can close the central barrier the, the, and have this big rip, which is the universe, you know, just stretching it out so fast that even galaxies got torn apart. And here, so that's a level of complexity, and you can all also go to curve, curving spatial, spatial slicings and also go to the dark energy. So these are the complexity models, and this is what it is. These are all the types of models that you can create with these four assumptions. But again, I want to learn physics, so I want to understand if I can falsify some of these assumptions. What have I had to do to falsify it? And for that, I believe supernova is not enough. For that, I will try to show you that you need to create a, cons there is a consistency between the background expansion of the universe and the structure formation that if, if broken, falsify one of those assumptions. How do we measure the structure formation of the universe? That's where uh, uh, Rogério Rosenfeld is working a lot in the dark energy survey. He used gravitational lensing of optical galaxies as one of the ways. You assume that gal the galaxies are spherical. You actually don't have to assume that, but in the simplify, let, let's just assume it is for the moment. But, but, the, but the, um, the photon that travels in a path that is lens by the structures in the universe, the more structure there is, the, 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 the higher the lens it is, and therefore you see them elliptical. And you can use the shapes of these galaxies if you have enough galaxies to reconstruct the amount of structures in the universe including voids, and the structures could be over-dense or under-dense, and they are both nonlinear structures. Uh, and now I'm gonna show the only big equation, uh, this, so don't despair, uh, which is the, how we compute the matter power spectrum, the Fourier transform of the matter autocorrelation function, that correlation function that comes when you correlate over-dense and under-dense regions. That's the matter power spectrum. And I'm just going to show that the, the, the physics comes basically from three terms, and I color coded given their origin. One that comes from inflation, and again, that's an example where the early universe can affect the late time behavior. We are not an experimental science where we can isolate the variables you don't want. There's a transfer function that takes into account both the early and the intermediate universe. This is where mass, if you put mass in neutrinos, things change. But if those assumptions of dark energy comes, then the growth factor, which is an overall amplitude shift that is scale independent, is the only term where dark energy can act. And there's a consistency in these models that's very interesting. If you know the background the expansion of the universe, how the universe expands exactly, you know this guy precisely and there's no free parameter. So by changing the consistency of between this guy and the background, we can actually falsify those assumptions. And that's a work that I have been done in the beginning of 2018. And uh, I think it's one of the work that I'm most proud of, even though it doesn't have a lot of citations, you know, that doesn't correlate always. Uh, and one of our results is that um, we use W for a supernova, and um, we found that they will be so good that our background expansion will be so well measured that the growth factor can only deviate from the best fit standard model by 5%. Therefore, if Rogério Rosenfeld measures a growth factor that deviates by 6%, then we know that at least at the 95% uh, the, the confidence region, uh, confidence level, that one of those assumptions are false. And if one of those assumptions are false, we have a revolution because there are, then dark energy will be very, very interesting. Uh, but, you know, 
Uh, I am a phenomenologist. I like to work with both theory and data and their connection. And theories are, theories are impatient. They don't weigh the data. So you can ask the question, if this paradigm doesn't explain the relationship between structure and geometry, what can explain? Well, one of the things you can make is modify gravity, which is a topic that is sensitive. Well, we try to do this in a phenomenology way in the dark energy survey, and I participate quite active in, in, this, uh, uh, in this paper. I uh, was one of the leaders of this analysis. So one of the way, you, there's two ways you can change gravity, the behavior of gravity. You can change the Poisson equation, which is how overdense and underdense generates um, um, the Newtonian potential, the analogous of Newtonian potential. Uh, but you can also change the modified Lenzi equation. You can, you can, you can have a, the, the Poisson equation to be the same as predicted by GR, but you can make photons to travel differently given uh, fixed overdense and underdense. And this is something that we can help measure, and this is something that the Dark Energy Survey ha is, is actually work on. Uh, another way that you can do is... So, what is the What's the zero? What's the equation? So, zero means it's exactly the Poisson equation, and there's, there's a functional form that how we... It's basically, you know, uh, Laplacian uh, 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 psi equals delta rho times a new function. I'm, I'm, it's proportional. I'm, not putting the form. Phi, what is phi here? No, you, no you, you, you could do this, the feedback, but no, we just, you know, for example, Laplacian of psi uh, is called delta rho times a function of time. You know, you, you, we do this very phenomenologically. And, oh, okay. okay. No. No, and I've been actually talking with Christopher Irata, which is a genius in cosmology, and one of, one of our fears when you do this, and we are following the community, is that because we don't, it doesn't come from a Lagrangian, we don't have near tertium, and therefore this modification can actually break the, the, the conservation of momentum. And we don't know how to fix that. If you do, let's write a paper. Uh, and the second one is, uh, is the change of the Lenzi equation, again, um, phenomenology. You know, that's the difference between the two relativistic potential, the, the Newtonian one and the one that's actually this interpretation which is perturbations on this curvature, uh, local curvature in spatial slicings, and we can change that phenomenologically. Okay, good. So another way you can do, uh, which is also very interesting to me, and I think this is one of the state-of-the-art predictions is this, is that you can make a direct coupling between dark energy and dark matter. So we made this, Mark Trudor is a very respected curious in, cosmo, in, uh, in particle physics and cosmology, and we have played with models where the dark energy is a scalar field, uh, phi, that has a direct coupling with dark matter. DM is for dark matter. And Again, this produces very different ways that background relates to, to, uh, to structure formation, and we, we, we make predictions on how the dark energy survey and LSST could probe this coupling to a few percent. Again, I'm showing this as just a proof of principle of what can happen if that consistency breaks. So, this is one of the two slides of conclusion, it's again, so I hope to have convinced you in this talk that the universe has these different epochs, lots of things can happen in these different epochs, and this entangling them is hard, and that's why uh, we, we need uh, the, the, the new data from the next decade, and that's why uh, I, I think we are far, cosmology is still a very active field of research that is desperate for both theoretical ideas and uh, new data, and, and it's, it, it, it's a field where it's perfect to have phenomenologists uh, like myself. And I also like to show that we like to probe dark energy. I just put lambda for um, um, provocative, but it could be any dark energy. And, uh, and usually there's two ways of trying to probe it. It's delay time, it's just measurement delay time geometry, all the structure formation, but I'd like to try to, to sell the idea that we need a third axis in order to really understand what's going on in dark energy. We need to understand what happens in the early in the universe. And with these three approaches, these three line of attacks, I do believe we will understand what dark energy is in the next 20 years. And this is some of the reference of the papers I have published. Thank you.
briefly, so we have time for questions. Um, um, hello. <laughs> I'm a bit confused on something you said about uh, the early universe. So you said you you you, you can have uh, if you think about the primordial point spectrum, you can have a preferred uh, spectrum come from data, as compared with inflation. So why do you use inflation anymore? Why just take this preferred spectrum come from data? Um, so, uh, I'm not sure <coughs> if I understood that that part. Yeah. So 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 basically the idea is that that power spectrum that which is the CLTT. Is proportional no, uh, to a primordial pulse spectrum that comes from inflation times a transfer function that is right after inflation. Okay, and in order to for a CMB to actually make predictions about the to the late universe, you know, you have to put physics on it. You know, it cannot just be free functions here. Otherwise, that's why we believe inflation. And inflation has many other predictions that besides this. Now, even the existence of the peaks itself comes from inflation because you need time coherence of your perturbation. I have, you know, if, if, if it was, for example, cosmic strings, uh, you know, instead of having this, you would just have a single blob that would be uh, pi over two uh, different than what we see. So there's this, this, there's other predictions. So, but we want to test the, the, the but here I'm talking about a prediction from a single field inflation that also is a slow row, so it's nearly cosmological constant. So that's what I want to test, not inflation paradigm itself, because that's correlated to your question, can you actually rule out inflation, which is a very interesting one. So it's this, and after I want to, to check that, you know, that means, um, and it's also a slow row. That means that, you know, two things happen in slow row. That's the potential of the scalar field. It's very flat, so you don't have, and also, it, you know, and you have, so this, the, the field is going down, but you also have the friction from the, um, the expansion of the universe, and that actually erases the initial conditions, because usually you have phi and phi dot as your initial conditions and two degrees of freedom, but in slow row, because you erase, you're like walking in, in um, gelé, how was it? Molasses, yeah, molasses or, and therefore you lose this and this becomes a function of position. Okay, so that's the idea I want to test. And the one way I do this is I, I, I take this guy and I said, this is this low row plus um, a set of principal components that will try to, to get deviations from the this low row predictions. And with that phenomenological approach, you show that the data actually is preferring, but we flow you know, only to sigma models of inflation that actually break this low row approximation. Thank you. So I wanted a few more details about this. You, you, you claim there's some experiment that will be done that with 5% accuracy, you can rule out ordinary gravity? Is that what you're saying? No, no, not ordinary gravity. I can rule out that, that I could have models that assume those four assumptions at the same time. GR. Uh, okay. The, so what experiment is going to measure this and what has been measured up to now? Okay, so I have this in my paper. So the idea is that, you know, you have this matter power spectrum that depends on K and A, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is proportional, you know, to the growth factor uh, times other stuff. And here is where dark energy predicts. Okay. And the idea is that the growth factor is a function of your the Hubble. How the, this is basically the expansion of the universe. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, we had the best simulated supernova in our previous paper, how W first can do. So the idea is W first predicts, probes the expansion of the universe. Given that, and we use uh, uh, principal component analysis to be very general, you can predict the growth factor precisely. So given how well you probe your observation expansion with the supernova, how, what, what are the range of your predictions? How much this guy can deviate from the best fit lambda CDN? And the answer is plus or minus 5%. Okay, if what, you have better supernova, you can put this, 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 this down. And what has been measured up to now? So what's the current state? That's what I'm asking. So we also have, so the, with the current state, uh, 
It's in, known up to what percent that it's correct. That's what I'm asking. So with the current one, depends on the curvature, and it can go to, I think, also 30 percent, something like this. It's much wider. WFS will be much better than what we have so far, right. and it, this is also addressed in the paper. And the whole the whole community agrees with this prediction uh, that with five percent, you're going to get from 30 percent to five percent. You're going to rule out. All of these four? No, it's not always this far. No, we, we will all, they, they, they cannot all be two at the same time. Which I, one I is incorrect, we don't know. I understand, but the yeah. whole community so, agrees that. Uh, so, that's an amazing prediction. Yeah, so this comes, so that, we are not the first one that did that. Uh, there, there, there was a similar paper from my advisor in 2009 that tried to do this for this decade, so. No, I'm just asking, the whole community agrees with this it prediction. Seems, for me, it seems possible. The, no, this the, five, the, it seems it's a theoretical prediction yeah. that when you, that the, that the observed so, measurement, yeah. when you get six times more accuracy, you know where it's going to sit. Yeah. So the paper okay. seems that's a, that's Rogero can say, but the paper seems solid. I have presented in many universities, and it seems a solid prediction. Well, the, the growth factor actually, um, there's some due to nonlinear uh, gravity. So I have to simulate also that. So this, yeah. this is the linear growth, but yeah. uh, you have no linear growth as well. No, then you can ask, can we <laughs> measure this to 5%? Because this is the prediction. You cannot predict the growth factor to be, di to be different than more than 5%. How do we get the 5% in the data error bars? Then you need a lot of modes, and you need nonlinear modes. And then you have to deal how right. you extract linear information from nonlinear right. modes. Right. That's a whole different story, and yeah. it will be it's, hard. Yes, yeah. so if you focus on the linear scales, so you're losing information, but if you focus on linear scales and have measurements with that precision, linear scales, yes, then because the theoretical predictions are sound uh, in the linear scales. So at the beginning of your talk, you showed this line with the evolution of the Hubble constant and the measurements, both the local measurements and the CMB measurements. And also the new gravitational wave one. Do you believe that with enough statistics on the gravitational wave sign, you will be able to decide between the two? Yes. Uh, so short answer is yes. Uh, long answer is uh, yes. And there's also another way of doing, uh, yeah, gravitational waves in the next 10 years will be amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but this is, let me just finish that sentence. Uh, there's an also interesting way that I actually really like, which is, is a prediction that comes from a different redshift, which is, comes from a strong lensing, and it's getting, is, is getting close. Rogeri knows this. It's getting, the error bars are actually, today is actually better than what we have from gravitational waves. And it can actually be, so if you ask me which will be the first gravitational wave or strong lensing to be the tiebreaker, I actually don't know. But both, yes. <laughs> But in your opinion, for which side it will it will go? For the local <laughs> measurements or Are for the? Are we still scene? reporting? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, okay. So I so so caveat. I did my my. I, I left Brazil because I wanted to do cosmic micro background, and there was no research in CMB in Brazil. And I did my PhD with Wayne Hu, which is did his entire career in CMB. So I'm a biased opinion. So. Let's say the following. I'm, there, there's things in, so basically most, most of the information comes from the TT spectrum and the dumping tail, okay, which is after the three peaks here, that region, okay? And that region is hard because there is, there is poor grounds and et cetera. So here's my statement. Uh, with, the, with the Simons Observatory, and I'm really trying to convince the Brazilian community to spend money to join Simons Observatory, which already knows how I'm passionate about this and how difficult it will be. But I have hopes that with Simons Observatory, we'll be able to measure the CLEE damping tail. Okay? And if that agrees with 67, then I will bet my a year's salary. Oh, <laughs> that is 67. But that needs to happen. So basically, we will measure the, C, the TT again, which actually will help. So if after Simon's Observatory, TT agrees with EE and both independently, although they have correlations, but you know they both converge to 67, then, then 
Yeah, okay, let's say three months of my salary, because the other, I, I, need, I need to survive. Uh, uh, then, but I will bet lots of beers that, uh, with that, you can buy lots of beer that it's 67. Uh, to, and, and I think that would be unbiased, uh, because it would be really hard to change the EE and GT at the same time. Um, Thanks. Again, but again, 67 in lambda CDM, because if you change the model, you change the CMB prediction. So whenever you say, what's the CMB prediction? In flat lambda CDM, it will be 67. Okay, so um, I don't see any other questions, so let's thank Vivian again. <laughs> and uh, th there should be some refreshments upstairs. Uh, yeah, good. Like it?